The Social Roots and the Social Function of Literature by Leon Trotsky. The quarrels about pure art and about art with a, with a tendency took place between the liberals and the populists. They do not become us. Materialistic dialectics are above this. From the point of view of an objective historical process, art is always a social servant and historic, historically utilitarian. It finds the necessary rhythm of words for dark and vague moods. It brings thought and feeling closer or contrasts them with one another. It enriches the spiritual experience of the individual and of the community. It refines feeling, makes it more flexible, more responsive. It enlarges the volume of thought in advance and not through the personal method of accumulated experience. It educates the individual, the social group, the class, and the nation. And this it does quite independently of whether it appears in a given case under the flag of a pure or of a frankly ten tendentious art. In our Russian social development, tendentiousness was the banner of the intelligentsia, which sought contact with the people. The helpless intelligentsia, crushed by tsarism and deprived of a cultural environment, sought support in the lower strata of society and tried to prove to the people that it was thinking only of them, living only for them, and that it loved them terribly. And just as the populists who went to the people were ready to do without clean linen and without a comb and without a toothbrush, so the intelligentsia was ready to sacrifice the subtleties of form in its art in order to give the most direct and spontaneous expression to the sufferings and hopes of the oppressed. On the other hand, pure art was the banner of the rising bourgeoisie, which could not openly declare its bourgeois character, and which at the same time tried to keep the intelligentsia in its service. The Marxist point of view is far removed from these te tendencies, which were historically necessary, but which have become historically passé. Keeping on the plane of scientific investigation, Marxism seeks with the same assurance the social roots of the pure as well as the as as well as of the tendentious art. It does not at all incriminate a poet with the thoughts and feelings which he expresses, but raises questions of a much more profound significance, namely to which order of feelings does a given artistic work correspond in all its peculiarities. What are the social conditions of these thoughts and feelings? What place do they occupy in the historic development of a society and of a class? And, further, what literary heritage has entered into the elaboration of the new form? Under the influence of what historic impulse have the new complexes of feelings and thoughts broken through the shell which divides them from the sphere of poetic consciousness? The investigation may become complicated, detailed, or individualized, but its fundamental idea will be that of the subsidiary role which art plays in the social process. Each class has its own policy in art, that is, a system of presenting demands on art which changes with time. For instance, the McCain's, like pre the, or fuck, the McKenna's, like protection of court and grand seigneur, the automatic relationship of supply and demand, which is supplemented by complex methods of influencing the individual, and so forth and so on. The social and even the personal dependence of art was not concealed, but was openly announced as long as art retained its court character. The wider, more popular, anonymous character of the rising bourgeoisie led, on the whole, to the theory of pure art, though there were many deviations from this theory. As indicated above, the tendentious literature of the populist intelligentsia was imbued with a class interest. The, the intelligentsia could not strengthen itself and could not conquer for itself a right to play a part in history without the support of the people. But in the revolutionary struggle, the class egotism of the intelligentsia was turned inside out, and, and in its left wing, it assumed the form of highest self-sacrifice. That is why the intelligentsia not only did not conceal art with a tendency, but proclaimed it, thus sacrificing art, just as it sacrificed many other things. 
our Marxist conception of the objective social dependence and social utility of art, when translated into the language of politics, does not at all mean a desire to dominate art by means of decrees and orders. It is not true that we regard only that art as new and revolutionary, which speaks of the worker, and it is nonsense to say that we demand that the poets should, should describe inevitably a factory chimney or the uprising against capital. Of course, the new art cannot, put, cannot but place the struggle of the proletariat in the center of its attention, but the plow of the new art is not limited to numbered strips. On the contrary, it must plow the entire field in all directions. Personal lyrics of the very smallest scope have an absolute right to exist within the new art. Moreover, the new man cannot be formed without a new lyric poetry. But to create it, the poet himself must feel the world in a new way. If Christ alone, or Sabaoth himself, bends over the poet's embraces, as in the case of Akhmatova, Tsvetveva, <laughs> Shkapskaya, and others, then this only goes to prove how much behind the times his lyrics are and how socially and aesthetically inadequate they are for the new man. Even where such terminology is not a survival of, of experience so much, so much as of words, it shows psychological inertia and therefore stands in contradiction to the consciousness of the new man. No one is going to prescribe themes to a poet or intends to, to prescribe them. Please write about anything you can think of, but allow the new class which considers itself and with reason called upon to build a new world to say to you in any given case, it does not make new poets of you to translate the philosophy of life of the 17th century into the language of the Ac Acmeists. The former of art is, to a certain and very large degree, independent, but the artist who creates this form and the spectator who is enjoying it are not empty machines, one for creating form and the other for appreciating it. They are living people with a crystallized psychology representing a certain unity, even if not entirely harmonious. This psychology is the result of social conditions. The creation and perception of art forms is one of the functions of this psychology. And no matter how wise the formalists try to be, their whole conception is simply based upon the fact that they ignore the psychological unity of the social man, who creates and who consumes what has been created. The proletariat has to have in art the expression of the new spiritual point of view which is just beginning to be formulated within him, and to which art must help him give form. This is not a state order, but a historic demand. Its strength lies in the objectivity, the objectivity of historic necessity. You cannot pass this by nor escape its force. Victor Shlovsky, who flits lightly from verbal formalism to the most subjective valuations, assumes a very uncompromising attitude toward the historical materialistic theory of art. In a booklet, in a booklet which he published in Berlin under the title of The March of the Horse, he formulates in the course of three small pages, brevity is a fundamental and, at any rate, an undoubted merit of, Sh of Shklovsky. Five, not four, not six, but five exhaustive arguments against the materialist conception of art. Let us examine these arguments, because it won't harm us to take a look and see what kind of chaff is handed out as the last word in scientific thought with the greatest variety of scientific references on these same three microscopic pages. If the environment and the relations of production, said Shklovsky, influenced art, then would not the themes of art be tied to the places which would correspond to their rel these relations? But themes are homeless. Well, and how about butterflies? According to Darwin, they also correspond to definite relations, and yet they they flit from place to place, just like an unweighted literatur. It is not easy to understand why Marxism should be supposed to condemn themes to a condition of serfdom. The fact that different peoples and different classes of the same people make use of the same themes merely shows how limited the human imagination is, and how man tries to maintain an economy of energy and every kind of creation, even in the artistic. 
Every class tries to utilize to the greatest possible degree the material and spiritual heritage of another class. Shklovsky's argument could be easily transferred into the field of productive technique. From ancient times on, the wagon has been based on one and the same theme, namely axles, wheels, and a shaft. However, the chariot of the Roman patrician was just as well adapted to his tastes and needs as was the carriage of Count Orlov's. Orlov, fitted out with inner comforts to the tastes of this favorite of Catherine the Great. The wagon of the Russian peasant is adapted to the needs of his household, to the strength of his little horse, and to the peculiarities of the country road. The automobile, which is undoubtedly a product of the new technique, shows nevertheless the same theme, namely four wheels on two axles. Yet every time a peasant's horse shies in terror before the blinding lights of an automobile on the Russian road at night, a conflict of two cultures is reflected in the episode. If environment expressed itself in novels, so runs the second argument, European science would not be breaking its head over the question of where the stories of A Thousand and One Nights were made, whether in Egypt, India, or Persia. To say that man's environment, including the artist's, that is, the conditions of his education and life, find expression in his art also, does not mean to say that such expression has a precise geographic, ethnographic, and statistical character. It is not at all surprising that it is difficult to decide whether certain novels were made in Egypt, India, or Persia, because the social conditions of these countries have much in common. But the very fact that European science is breaking its head trying to solve this question from these novels themselves shows that these novels reflect an environment, even though unevenly. No one can jump beyond himself. Even the ravings of an insane person contain nothing that the sick man had not received before from the outside world. But it would be an insanity of another order to regard his ravings as the accurate reflection of an external world. Only an experienced and thoughtful psychiatrist who knows the past of the patient will be able to find the reflected and distorted bits of reality in the contents of his ravings. Artistic creation, of course, is not a raving, though it is also a deflection, a changing, and a transformation of reality in accordance with the peculiar laws of art. However fantastic art may be, it cannot have at its disposal any other material except that which is given to it by the world of three dimensions and by the narrower world of class society. Even when the artist creates heaven and hell, he merely transforms the experience of his own life into his phantasmagorious, almost to the point of his landlady's unpaid bill. If the features of class and caste are deposited in art, continues Shklovsky, then how does it come that the various tales of the great Russians about their noblemen are the same as their fairy tales about their priest? In essence, this is merely... Oh, fuck. In essence, this is merely a paraphrase of the first argument. Why cannot the fairy tales about the noblemen and about the priest be the same? And how does this contradict, contradict Marxism? The proclamations which are written by well-known Marxists not infrequently speak of landlords, capitalists, priests, generals, and other exploiters. The landlord undoubtedly differs from the capitalist, but there are cases when, there are, when they are considered under one head. Why then cannot folk art in certain cases treat the noblemen and the priests together as the representatives of the classes which stand above the people? and which plunder them. In the cartoons of Moore and of Demi of Denny, the priest often stands side by side with the landlord without any damage to Marxism. If, ethnogra if ethnographic traits were reflected in art, Shklovsky goes on, the folklore about the peoples beyond the border would not be interchangeable and cannot be told by any one folk about another. As you see, there is no letting up here. Marxism does not maintain at all that ethnographic traits have an independent character. On the contrary, it emphasizes the all-determining significance of natural and economic conditions in the formation of folklore. The similarity of conditions in the development of the herding and agricultural and primarily peasant peoples, and the similarity in the character of their mutual influence upon one another, 
cannot but lead to the creation of a similar folklore. And from the point of view of the question that interests us here, it makes absolutely no difference whether these homogeneous themes arose independently among different peoples, as the reflection of a life experience which was homogeneous in its fundamental traits and which was reflected through the homogeneous prism of a peasant imagination, or whether the seeds of these fairy tales were carried by a favorable wind from place to place, striking root wherever the ground turned out to be favorable. It is very likely that, in reality, these methods were combined. And finally, as a separate argument, the reason Marxism is incorrect in the fifth place, Shklovsky points to the theme of abduction, which goes through Greek comedy and reaches Ostrovsky. In other words, our critic repeats, in a special form, his very first argument. As we see, even insofar as formal logic is concerned, all is not well with our formalist. Yes, themes migrate from people to people, from class to class, and even from author to author. This means only that the human imagination is economical. A new class does not begin to create all of culture from the beginning, but enters into possession of the past, assorts it, touches it up, rearranges it, and builds it on it further. If there were no such utilization of the second-hand wardrobe of the ages, historic processes would have no progress at all. If the theme of Ostrovsky's drama came to him through the Egyptians and through Greece, then the paper on which Ostrovsky developed his theme came to him as a development of the Egyptian papyrus through the Greek parchment. Let us take another and closer analogy. The fact that the critical methods of the Greek sophists, who were the pure formalists of their day, have penetrated the theoretical consciousness of Shklovsky does not in the least change the fact that Shklovsky himself as a very picturesque product of a definite social environment and of a definite age. Shklovsky's destruction of Marxism in five points reminds us very much of those articles which were published against Darwinism in the magazine The Orthodox Review in the good old days. If the doctrine of the origin of man from the monkey were true, with the learned Bishop Nicanor of Odessa 30 or 40 years ago, then our grandfathers would have had distinct signs of a tale or would have noticed such a characteristic in their grandfathers and grandmothers. Second, as everybody knows, monkeys can only give birth to monkeys. Fifth, Dar Darwinism is incorrect because it contradicts formalism. I beg your pardon, I meant to say the formal decisions of the Universal Church Conferences. The advantage of the learned monk consisted, however, in the fact that he was a frank Passeist and took his cue from the Apostle Paul and not from physics, chemistry, or mathematics, as the futurist, futurist Shklovsky does. It is unquestionably true that the need for art is not created by economic conditions, but neither is the need for food created by economics. On the contrary, the need for food and warmth creates ex On the contrary, the need for food and warmth creates economics. It is very true that one cannot always go by the principles of Marxism in deciding whether to reject or to accept a work of art. A work of art should, in the first place, be judged by its own law, that is, by the law of art. But Marxism alone can explain why and how a given tendency in art has originated in a given period of history. In other words, who it was who made a demand for such an artistic form and not for another, and why. It would be childish to think that every class can entirely and fully create its own art from within itself, and particularly that the proletariat is capable of creating a new art by means of closed art guilds or circles, or by the Organization for Proletarian Culture, etc. Generally speaking, the artistic work of man is continuous. Each new rising class places itself on the shoulders of its preceding one, but this continuity is dialectic. That is, it finds itself by means of internal repulsions and breaks. New artistic needs or demands for new literary and artistic points of view are stimulated by economics through the development of a new class, and minor stimuli are supplied by changes in the position of the class under the influence of the growth of its wealth and cultural power. Artistic creation is always a complicated turning inside out of old forms, under the influence of new stimuli which orig originate outside of art. In this large sense of the word, art is a handmaiden, 
It is not a disembodied element feeding on itself, but a function of social man indissolubly tied to his life and and environment. And how characteristic it is, if one were to reduce every social superstition to its absurdity, that Shklovsky has come to the idea of art's absolute independence from the social environment at a period of Russian history when art has revealed with such utter frankness its spiritual, environmental, and material dependence upon definite social classes, subclasses, and groups. Materialism does not deny the significance of the element of form, either in logic, jurisprudence, or art. Just as a system of jurisprudence can and must be judged by its internal logic and consistency, so art can and must be judged from the point of view of its achievements in form, because there can be no art without them. However, a juridical theory which attempted to establish the independence of law from social conditions would be defective at its very base. Its moving force lies in economics, in class contradictions. The law gives only a formal and an internally harmonized expression of these phenomena, not of their individual peculiarities, but of their general character, that is, of the elements that are repetitive and permanent in them. We can see now with a clarity which is rare in history how new law is made. It is not done by logical deduction, but by empirical measurement and by adjustment to the economic needs of the new ruling class. Literature, whose methods and processes have their roots far back in the most distant past and represent the accumulated experience of verbal craftsmanship, expresses the thoughts, feelings, moods, points of view, and hopes of the new epoch and of its new class. One cannot jump beyond this, and there is no need of making the jump, at least for those who are not serving an epoch already past, nor a class which has already outlived itself. The methods of formal analysis are necessary, but insufficient. You may count up the alliterations in popular proverbs, classify metaphors, count up the number of vowels and consonants in a wedding song. It will undoubtedly enrich our knowledge of folk art. In one way or another, but if you don't know the peasant system of sewing and the life that is based on it, if you don't know the part of the scythe plays, and if you have not mastered the meaning of the church calendar to the peasant, of the time when the peasant marries or when the peasant women give birth, you will have only understood the outer shell of folk art, but the kernel will not have been reached. The architectural scheme of the Cologne Cathedral can be established by measuring the base and the height of its arches, by determining the three dimensions of its naves, the dimensions and the placement of the columns, etc. But without knowing what a medieval city was like, what a guild was, or what was the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages, the Cologne Cathedral will never be understood. The effort to set art free from life, to to declare it a craft sufficient unto itself, devitalizes and kills art. The very need of such an operation is an unmistakable symptom of intellectual decline. The analogy with the theological arguments against Darwinism, which was made above, may appear to the reader external and anecdotal. That may be true to some extent, but a much deeper connection exists. The formalist theory inevitably reminds a Marxist who has done any reading at all of the familiar tunes of a very old philosophic melody. The jurists and the moralists, to recall at random the German Stamler and our own subjectivist Mikulovsky, tried to prove that morality and law could not be determined by economics, because economic life was was unthinkable outside of juridical and ethical norms. True, the formalists of law and morals did not go so far as to assert the complete independence of law and ethics from economics. They recognized a certain complex mutual relationship of factors, and these factors, while influencing one another, retain the qualities of independent substances coming coming no one knew whence. The assertion of complete independence of the aesthetic factor from the influence of social conditions, as is made by Shlovsky, is an instance of specific hyperbole whose roots, by the way, lie in social conditions too. It is the megalomania of aesthetics turning our hard reality on its head. 
Apart from this peculiarity, the constructions of the formalists have the same kind of defective methodology that every other kind of idealism has. To a materialist, religion, law, morals, and art represent separate aspects of one and the same process of social development, though they differentiate themselves from their industrial basis, become complex, strengthen and develop their special characteristics in detail, politics, religion, law, ethics, ethics, and aesthetics remain, nonetheless, functions of social man and obey the laws of his social organization. The idealist, on the other hand, does not see a unified process of historic development which evolves the necessary organs and functions from within itself, but a crossing or combining and interacting of certain independent principles, the religious, political, juridical, aesthetic, and ethical substances, which find their origin and explanation in themselves. The dialectic idealism of Hegel arranges these substances, which are the eternal categories, in some sequence by reducing them to a genetic unity, regardless of the fact that this unity with Hegel is the absolute spirit which divides itself in the process of its dialectical manifestation into various factors, Hegel's system, because of its dialectic character, not because of its idealism, gives an idea of historic reality which is just as good as the idea of a man's hand that a glove gives when turned inside out. But the formalists, and their greatest genius was Kant, do not look at the dynamics of development, but at a cross-section of it, on the day and at the hour of their own philosophic revelation. At the crossing of the line, they reveal the complexity and multiplicity of the object, not of the process, because they do not think of processes. This complexity they analyze and classify. They give names to the elements which are at once transformed into essences, into sub-absolutes, without father or mother, to wit, religion, politics, morals, law, art, here we no longer have a glove of history turned inside out, but the skin torn from the separate fingers dried out to a degree of complete abstraction, and this hand of history turns out to be the product of the interaction of the thumb, the index, the middle finger, and all the other fact factors. The aesthetic factor is the little finger, the smallest, but not the least beloved. In biology, vitalism is a variation of the same fetish, of presenting the separate aspects of the world process, without understanding its inner relation. A creator is all that is lacking for a super-social, absolute morality or aesthetics, or for a super-physical, absolute vital force. The multiplicity of independent factors, factors without beginning or end, is nothing but a masked polytheism. Just as Kantian idealism represents historically a translation of Christianity into the language of, language of rationalistic philosophy, so all the varieties of idealist, idealistic formalization, either openly or secretly, lead to a god as the cause of all causes. In comparison with the oligarchy of a dozen sub-absolutes of the, of the idealistic philosophy, a single personal creator is already an element of order. Herein lies the deeper connection between the formalist refutations of Marxism and the theological refutations of Darwinism. The formalist school represents an abortive idealism applied to the question of art. The formalists show a fast-ripening religiousness. They are followers of St. John. They believe that in the beginning was the word, but we believe that in the beginning, beginning was the deed, the word followed as its phonetic shadow.